Good evening. I'm going to be reading from Psalms 118, starting at verse 1, for our call to worship. I'll tell you, it's so much easier to wear one of those headsets. <laughs> then it feels like you're just standing up here talking. But when you, as soon as you grab this, it feels like I'm supposed to perform, and I don't know how to do that. So anyway, let me get started with this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take trust, refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. And uh, we made it to another year. Just when you thought 2020 couldn't get any worse, the volcano starts up and Bob comes back, but God's still on the throne, and he's worthy to be praised. So we are blessed to be able to come and start this year with worship and give him the glory that's due his name. Stand.
sound awesome this afternoon. Um, I want to read a verse for you, for you out of Hebrews. The chapter is chapter 4. Um, we're going to read 14 and 16. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Um, so we're going we're gonna to sing about that mercy right now, um, the mercy that renews every morning and that we need so desperately. Let's sing. Darkness, 
person in this room can truly say that. Lord, that we love you, that in this moment, in this moment, you are all we see. You are the focus of all of our attention, God. Let that focus and that passion be carried out through the rest of this service. God, we know you have something to speak to us. We have something to hear. So Lord, let us be receptive. Let us be open to your word. And God, we do love you. 
It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, peace be with you, church. If you can remain standing and open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and this evening we're going to begin in verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Father, as your people... We gather together here to hear from you, to worship you, to honor you, Lord. And Lord, they pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people, that your spirit would be amongst us, that you would open up our hearts, enlighten them, enlighten our spiritual eyes, that we may grasp, even if a little bit, Lord, that we may grasp the goodness of your grace and your love. Father, be with us and teach us right now for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Aloha to all of you. If you are new here with us, we welcome you to our gathering. Um, And Happy New Year's to all of you. 2020 is officially over. Uh, No more 2020 jokes, but hopefully 2021 will be less eventful. A couple announcements, actually one little announcement. Um, This month, we are starting a marriage seminar, Um, and we are honored to have Jay Alvaro here amongst us, and um, he is doing this for free. He just wants to serve our church. Here's a, he's a marriage and family counselor, therapist. He's been doing this for a very long time. Lots of experience. He's seen it all. And he just wants to bless us as a church, bless the community. And so I just want to invite you all to come to this um, event. It's going to be going on for, I think, eight weeks. Yeah. Um, this is for all. Um, if you're single and you're not blessed with the gift of celibacy, you plan on getting married, like, this is for you. This is, you're going you're gonna to gain from this. Um, every married couple um, or dating couple, this is for you as well. Um, this is not for those who are in ICU in, mar- in their marriage. They're, this is not for those who critically need it. This is for all of us. All of us in some stage in our marriage, we have certain things that we struggle with, and all of us need this. So I hope that, you know, you will be reinvigorated through this, that maybe some sparks will fly, maybe some freshening up will happen in your marriage through this. Um, This is free. He's just literally blessing us. Um, And we are going to have babysitters, so you don't have to find babysitters. Kids are not an excuse. You can bring them here with you, and someone will take care of them. Um, The only thing is um, that you can purchase is a book, a book that you can follow along. Um, And yeah, Jay himself, I think, after service will give us even more details. But I just want to invite all of you to join us in this marriage seminar. Um, I also want to thank Uncle Craig for preaching last week for us. You would never know it's his first time preaching. And what I love about him is he made us feel like we were in his living room. 
And many of you have been in his living room and know exactly how that is. And him and his wife, Auntie Margie, they're a huge blessing to us as a church. They have this gift of hospitality. Um, and yeah, they're just a blessing to us, and we're thankful for them. And so, this week we are back in the book of Ephesians. We took five weeks off um, to focus on the season of Advent, and I hope you were blessed um, by those sermons as we were um, reminded, as we were called to wait and to anticipate the second coming of Jesus as we celebrate his first coming. And today in our verses, uh, Paul is praying to God on the behalf of Ephesians. He's praying for them, and not just for them, but he's also praying on our behalf. And I hope that today we will see the value and the importance of this prayer. And I hope that this prayer will become our prayer for ourselves for our families, for our brothers and sisters around us. And so it's been five weeks, and just to refresh our memory a bit, here's a little recap of what has been going on in Ephesians so far. In chapter 1, Paul opens up with this praise. Praise is just flowing out of his mouth as he worships God for all that he is doing, for his spiritual gifts in the past in the present, and that are coming to us in the future. And Paul is clear. He's like, we do not deserve these gifts. In fact, at one time, we were far off. We were alienated from God. We did not belong to the family of God. We were dead in our sin. We were separated from God. And then in chapter 2, Paul uses this phrase. He says, but God. But now. Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And later on in Ephesians 2.13, he says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And so Paul shows us how God took two people, the Jews and the Gentiles, people who were dead in trespasses and sin, and he made us into one people. People who would otherwise be at odds. And he made us a new community. His church, his temple that he indwells through the Holy Spirit. And finally, in chapter 3, Paul shows us how the church is no small thing. It's not this insignificant gathering that happens every week. But he shows us that the church displays to the world and to the cosmic powers, to the spiritual forces, to the rulers and authorities, the manifold wisdom of God. The church is a display how God took a diverse people, enemies, People from many backgrounds, from many languages and cultures, and he united them by the blood of Jesus. And now they belong together as a family of God. And so the existence of the church, this diverse church, it displays the great wisdom of God. And so with all of this in mind, as Paul is excited, he's excited for what God is doing. He prays, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Paul bows down in humility. Bowing down was not like a typical thing you would do. Most of the people prayed standing. So this would be a great sign of humility 
of submission to God's plan. Submission to God. So he gets on his knees to pray, to petition on our behalf. And why is he praying for us? What is he asking of God? As we read through this letter, what quickly becomes obvious is that Paul is overflowing with excitement and praise. There's this section, I believe it's verse 4 through 14, where there's not even a dot in the original Greek. Paul just goes. He throws all grammar out the door. He is so full of worship. He cannot contain himself. And the reason that he's overflowing with excitement is because he stepped behind the curtain. He saw something. Paul got a revelation. God has revealed a mystery to him, and Paul can't contain himself. He wants everybody else to know this mystery, and he wants all of us, God's people, to celebrate with Paul. Paul is celebrating the grandeur of God's cosmic plans from eternity past into eternity future. He's celebrating the magnitude of God's redeeming work, the riches of his love and grace as God redeems sinners to himself. And so Paul is inviting us to come and see this as well, to celebrate God's grace with all the saints. And if you remember, he already prayed this before. He prayed that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened so that we would realize the riches of God's glorious grace. But Paul is also aware that there are many obstacles in our way. There is stuff that eclipses the glory of of God in our hearts. And that is why Paul prays for us. Paul is aware that Christians will sometimes have to go to church at 4 p.m. and struggle to keep awake through a sermon. And listening to Paul, you may say, okay, Paul, your excitement is awesome. You've got all this knowledge and revelation. You're excited. I, on the other hand, can barely collect enough strength to engage my family after I get back from work. I don't have the mental capacity to do that. Paul, I got kids. Do you know what kids do to you? It's hard to get excited about anything at the end of the day. Paul, if only you knew what is going on in my life. And here's the deal. Paul Paul is very much aware of what it means to be human, what struggles we face, and that is why he prays for us. And here's what he prays. Verse 16. That according to the riches of his glory... God may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with with all the fullness of God. So essentially, Paul is praying for God to strengthen us. Strengthen us in our inner being, to ground us and to root us in love. Paul is praying that we may, just like him, may be filled with the fullness of Christ and comprehend the greatness of his love. And so here in verse 16, Paul shows us where this work of God needs to happen, where this strengthening needs to happen. He accurately puts his finger right on it. He calls it the inner being. 
The inner being is where the strengthening needs to take place. One theologian defines the inner being like this. It's the seat of personal consciousness. The inner being is our inner existence. It is our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. It's our entire self, all of our experiences, all of our convictions, all of our morals, the good and the bad, the visible and the invisible. It is everything that makes us us. That is the inner being. And Paul puts his finger on it and he says, that is where the work needs to happen. This is where God's power needs to strengthen us. Our inability to comprehend God, our inability to worship God as we should, our inability to delight in Him as we should, that inability is not, does not come. We don't have that because of some external forces, some problems or circumstances out there. First and foremost, our inability to love God as we should stems from our inner being. It flows from our very own heart. We forget the goodness of God. We neglect, we lose perspective, we leak vision, we leak the good news of the gospel, we get excited about Jesus one day and lose it the next. The problem is our heart. It's our inner being. That is why we need this prayer. And not just once, but always. And yes, we are redeemed. We have been saved by God. He dwells in us through his spirit. But I'm sure you will agree with me. We all have a lot of baggage. We all have the unnecessary stuff in our inner being. Sin. Things that get in the way. Things that others don't even know about us. Things that eclipse God's great goodness. Things that eclipse Jesus. These things, they dwell in our hearts. They take up room. They take up mental an emotional capacity within us. Sometimes they cripple us. And that is why we need God's power. That is why Paul prays that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. What a powerful prayer. And so what is the result? What happens when we are strengthened by God's Spirit? What happens when we have His power in us? And we find that answer in verse 17. He continues the thought, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And this word dwell literally means rule. Not as a guest, not someone who comes to just stay a night or two at your house, but someone who comes and claims it as their home. They come and rule. And that is the prayer of, 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 of Paul, that Christ may rule in our hearts through faith. And so when God strengthens us with his power, in our inner being, we decrease. Jesus increases. 
the capacity, the room in our heart that's given to other stuff is moved out of the way and given to Christ. And the proof that God is strengthening you is this. When Christ dwells in our hearts, when he occupies our inner being, he becomes the center of our thoughts, of our will, of our emotions. He rules. And when Christ rules, our hearts are transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And this work, this is only the work of God. We can't do this. That is why Paul isn't saying, A, try harder. That's why he's not saying focus longer, do better, get out of the rut. No, he prays. He falls on his knees before the sovereign God and he pleads on behalf of the saints, Father, strengthen them. Do the work that only you can do. The power we need it comes from him. And so again, Paul is calling us as God's people to see and to realize the glory of God's redeeming work. He wants us to see the magnitude of his love for us, the riches of his glory. Paul wants us to join him in worship. To truly join him in worship, not just go through the motions. And Paul's aware. He's aware that there are things that eclipse the glory of God in our hearts. And so he's helping us see how God's power can bring us to the fullness of God. First, God can strengthen us in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in us. In the second part of this text, he prays for us to be rooted and grounded in Christ's love. And so here, he brings up two examples. He brings up two images. A botanical one and an architectural one. Rooted and grounded. The image of being rooted, um, a plant with good deep roots bearing much fruit, good fruit, and grounded. This word in Greek literally means to lay a solid foundation. He says that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. By praying for us to be rooted, by calling us to be grounded in God's love, Paul again is pointing to the nature of our inner being. Our inner being is always rooted and grounded in something. We're always building on something. The moment we wake up, we start doing it. And if we're honest, often it's not the love of God. The reason that Paul is on his knees pleading for us to be grounded in Jesus' love is because often... We are not. What we, have, what we are grounded in, it plays a major role in how our life goes. What we are grounded in will drive us. It will consume us. It will preoccupy us. And whatever our inner being is rooted in will have massive implications on our life. That may be our pride. It may be our guilt and shame. Our past. Anxieties. These things can play very subconsciously. 
traumas of life. But these are all toxic soils. Rooting in them will bring horrible fruit. These are bad foundations. Grounding, establishing yourself on these things will bring unstable and shaky results. But how easy is it for us to be consumed with these things? To get caught up in our pride. To be lost in shame and guilt. To be overwhelmed with anxiety. To be captured by the idols of our heart. So easy. They sneak up on us without us even knowing. And then we find ourselves wondering why is the glory of God so obscure in our hearts, so dim? Why has the love for Jesus gone cold? What happened? Paul shows us. Paul is praying for something amazing. Paul is showing us the, the antidote to our blindness. The antidote to our cold hearts, our anxious hearts, our wandering inner beings. The antidote is the love of Jesus. It's not go beat yourself up. It's not go repeat this ten times. It's not go do something for ten years. No. The antidote to our cold hearts. To hearts lost in guilt and shame is the love of God. It's so simple, yet it's so profound. The greatest thing we can devote ourselves to is to ground and root ourselves in the love that our God has towards us. It's the most stable and is the most life-giving place to be. Life can take all sorts of turns. It can bring all sorts of things towards us. 2020 can happen over and over again. And if we are grounded and rooted in the love of Christ, we will have life. It's the most life-changing experience to comprehend, to get a glimpse, even a small one, of how great God's love is for us. Being rooted and grounded in love you may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Paul is calling us to appreciate God's love. He's calling us to realize the massive implications of God's love. He's showing us that the inner man, the inner being, all of its insecurities, all of its shame, all of its need for acceptance, it can all be resolved. That security and acceptance can be found in Christ's love. God knows us fully and completely. He knows us better than we know ourselves. The things that we are trying to blot out of our memory, he knows. And he accepts us. He loves us. 
John Stott says, quote, Christ's love is broad enough to include all mankind, Jews, Gentiles, people out of every language and nation. Christ's love is long enough to last eternity. It is deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner. It is high enough to exalt him into heaven. End quote. And this love is not cheap. It was incredibly expensive. And we did nothing to deserve it. On the contrary, we did everything to reject it. Our sin, it separated us from the love of God. It alienated us from Him and His love. And to bring us to Himself... God did not sweep our sin under the rug and was like, all right, I love you guys. No. To bring us to himself, Jesus laid down his life for us. We just celebrated Christmas. We remembered how the eternal God humbled himself took on the form of man to die for us sinners and to take the punishment that we deserve. And we see through this epistle that from eternity past into eternity future, God is preoccupied with bringing glory to himself by redeeming and saving sinners from sin and darkness. And bringing them into his kingdom through Jesus Christ. That is the greatness of his love. The God of this universe. The creator of everything in existence. As Paul puts it, the father in whom all families find their existence. In whom every family on earth is named. In other words, everything finds its existence in God. This God is the one who is glorifying himself through loving and redeeming sinners like you and I. And what we see here, even though Paul tries to put a dimension to Christ's love, he says, he describes it as the breadth and length and height and depth at the end of verse at the end he kind of gives up on that and in verse 19 he says the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge even though we try to put some sort of limits to it we can't the depth never stops the height never stops the length never stops it's unsearchable we will spend an eternity trying to comprehend His love. And interestingly, when Paul calls us to comprehend his love, when he prays for us, he says that we would do this with all of the saints. In other words, it's really hard to comprehend God's love on your own. The place where you and I will see God's love on display is in community with other Christians. And we may say, as we meet people, God, really him, her, you saved them? Hearing each other's testimonies, we can attest to this deep, wide, long love of God. Seeing God bring people to himself from all sorts of backgrounds and cultures, it shows us how much greater God's love is than we could ever have for people. Church, God is inviting us to something amazing. You want stability in your inner being. You want to be grounded. You want to be rooted. You want to be strengthened. The answer is the love of God. The love of God is not obscure. 
The love of God is not vague, but it has been clearly demonstrated to us and revealed to us through Jesus. It is incredibly clear. Church, I'm sure we'll all agree that we need power. We need to be strengthened. We need to be rooted and grounded. We need strength to comprehend, to even begin to grasp God's love. And here's the good news. Our needs are met. We have needs, and God has an unlimited supply of everything that we need. Paul says that he may grant what we need according to the riches of his glory. That is where God draws from to give to us. From the riches of his glory, and they are unlimited. There is no need that God cannot supply. You are never too weak for God. God raised our dead spirits from the dead. Surely he can supply the strength and power that your inner being needs. And so this new year, resolve to pray more. Pray for yourself. Pray for your families. Pray for those around you. Join the prayer of Paul. Pray this exact prayer. This New Year's resolve to be honest with yourself and with God. Don't try to push away everything that is going on within your inner being. I can't even say it. I mean, we're all so different. We all have such different struggles. Don't push it away. Don't drown it out. Come before God. Be honest with him. Confess to him your weakness. Confess to him how you're prone to wonder. Confess your need to him that you need to be strengthened. In the moment of doubt, in the midst of anxiety, shame, pride, sin, Confess it to him and pray that he would move in power in your inner being. And he will. Paul closes this chapter with a great benediction, with a great promise. Verse 20, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Church, God is able to do far more than we ever can ask. He's a God of abundance. He has never-ending power. Pray. Pray and have hope. Even if you don't get all of your words right, he is faithful. He sees the cry of our hearts. He is a father who is attentive to his children. And he will give us more than we could ever imagine or ask. He gives abundantly to his children. All we have to do is ask. Let's pray. Father, you know every single heart in this room. You know the struggles of every inner being. You know what we need. You know, Father, what obscures your glory. What dwells in us where Christ needs to dwell. And so, Father, we admit that we are weak we admit that we are powerless. We admit that we do things that we do not want to do. 
We confess and we ask, Lord, move in our inner beings, in your power. Strengthen us. Father, root us in the love of Christ. Show us, give us at least a little bit of ability to comprehend the depth, the height, the length, the breadth of the love of Christ. Your love for us, O oh God. I pray that you would do this work in us, God. That we would be a church that would operate on a foundation and be rooted in your love, God. Nothing else. Not our ambition. Not our own desires. Father, but your love. That you, Jesus, would rule in our hearts. And Lord, those who find themselves lost, confused, powerless to move out of their guilt, their shame, from underneath the weight of anxiety. Lord, I just pray that you would come alongside them, that you would meet them in their weakness right now, Lord, that you would strengthen them, that you would show them a way out. Father, strengthen your church. May we, with Paul, rejoice and worship you gladly. May we celebrate what you have done. May we shout with joy. And may we declare your glory to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to sing, I want to invite you to stand. Sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone. Solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross where Jesus died, the breath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. Grip on me, 
for I am His and He is mine. But with the precious blood of Christ, alone, alone. No guilt in life. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of men can ever pluck me from his hand. Until he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Amen. And as we continue, um, we're going to enter our time of offering right now. And I just want to encourage you, um, kind of like we do every week, um, to, to search your hearts. Um, we're called to be generous givers, and we're starting a new year. Thank you for partnering with us last year, those of you that did. Um, and if you um, call Shore Break Your Home Church, I would encourage you. There's several ways to give, a text option and an online giving option. There's a basket in the back or a box in the back at the Connect desk outside. Um, and so I just would encourage you to, uh, and, and we say this uh, kind of a lot, but to live life kind of with, with a loose grasp on things um, that, that you may receive and also give freely. Uh, and so we get the chance to sing a song. Um, we read this benediction. It's out of Numbers chapter 6. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his smile upon you and give you peace. And we get to sing um, these words now. Um, and so I would encourage you as we do that, um, sing these um, to each other, over one another. Allow us to sing these over you. Um, sing them over your situation. I mean, may they be an encouragement to you.
26, 11 and 12 say this. I will make my dwelling among you, and you sh I shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. We're going to sing a beautiful bridge that um, almost comes across like a chant, but it's these beautiful, beautiful words that we're just declaring not only over ourselves and the people around us, but we're just declaring them to the Lord that we believe that they're true. So we ask that you sing that to, sing that out loud, sing that to the Lord with a reverent heart. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 he is for you
Uh, take a seat for just a second, please. Wow. What a great worship service today, and what a great way to start the, the new year. As they say here, Haoli Makahikiho, which means Happy New Year. And I know for all of us, uh, a lot of people at this time of the year, you make New Year's resolutions. As I look around in the group here, I see a lot of you folks here, probably, I'm not sure, maybe your wives are thinking, I know what a good news, New Year's resolution is for my husband, or maybe my husband's saying this about the wife, but it's a, uh, this might be a good time, as Leo mentioned, uh, for us to start this new year. Um, as he said, again, 2020, you know what they say, hindsight is 2020, so we can uh, look at it that way, but we got look, something to look forward to. And... Um, what we're going to be doing, uh, starting on January 14th, we'll be meeting for eight straight weeks. So as Leo mentioned, uh, the women's group and the men's group have uh, graciously, uh, uh, Craig and Margie have graciously um, uh, decided that they would let this time be the time that we spend. So um, when you're used to, if you're used to going to either of those, this will be the time you're coming. Some folks had asked, is it every other week? It'll be every Thursday. Um, so... Uh, you'll have child care here. Uh, one of the things I'm going to need for you guys to do to help me out uh, is sign up. There's a couple of things I've learned since I've been in Hawaii, uh, uh, this thing called island time. Um, and also, a lot of times people have a tendency to sign up maybe on the 14th. Um, if you can, one of the things that would help us is if you sign up early, it'll help us to know how much child care we need uh, for assistance uh, for Leo. Uh, one of my weaknesses, I, I usually, when I do these kinds of things, I just kind of show up and teach, and all these logistics are normally taken care of, but I'm, I'm hoping that there will be some folks here to step in. As a matter of fact, when we go out in the back here, um, Lynn, who's notorious for tackling people to get you to sign up, she'll be back there with me to help uh, folks sign up. Uh, you'll notice on the sign-up sheet, we'll ask you for some contact information. Uh, if you want a workbook, while the workbooks aren't required, or they're highly recommended. Um, it's a really good resource. We'll be using this book called Intimate Encounters. Um, and, and this, this uh, seminar that we'll be going through, it's very practical. One of the things you guys heard in Leo's message today, Paul did a fa fantastic job in his prayer for spiritual strength of really sort of encapsulating the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And we saw that as he was sharing with us those various components. What we're going to be doing is the, uh, this uh, seminar will be us unpacking the great commandment love of Christ, how to love God by loving others. And so it's about relationship. As Leo mentioned, um, this is obviously for couples. But if you are a single person and you're looking one day to be married, this will be a great time to uh, look at some of God's design for a healthy marriage. If you're a married couple and you've been married for longer than mm, maybe a day or two, you probably could benefit. Uh, this is meant to strengthen marriages. Um, the healthiest marriages to marriages that are challenged. Uh, it's for all of those. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, doers, not just hearers only. So it's practical. It's, uh, we'll be taking God's word, taking his design, and we'll be looking at how to practically apply that in your marriages, in your relationships. And this goes beyond just marriage. Um, it'll help you with your parenting. It'll help you with extended relationships that you have with anybody. So if you are a human being, you're involved probably in a relationship unless you're a monk here just visiting for one, uh, one weekend. Uh, but Probably you're here and you have some relationship that would benefit from, from going through this. So I'm hoping you'll join us. Um, like I said, if you'll sign up, the sooner we know how many people that'll help us. Uh, the workbooks, um, I was, it, it, they're going to be $12 a piece. I do also recommend that each person get a workbook. Uh, in the workbook, there's uh, you know, lots of opportunities to answer questions and so forth. So obviously, if you have your own workbook, you can fill it out your questions for yourself. Uh, husbands, try not to copy um, off of your wives, if possible. Um, it's, it's for each of you to use, and hopefully it'll be beneficial to you. So um, again, we're looking forward to that time together, hoping that, uh, that you guys will be uh, here to join us. And, um, and I want to, the time frame, we're still, um, I'm working out probably, again, because I'm thinking about, you know, having, dropping off kids, 
probably will, uh, we're going to have about an hour and 15, 20 minutes of actual time here. Uh, so dropping off kids and being able to be out before 8 o'clock is kind of our goal. So probably 6 to 8, uh, by 6.15, dropping off your kids and then picking them up by 7.45 at the latest, something like that. Um, so that way we'll have time for you guys to interact if you have questions for conversation, uh, input on your part, okay? So uh, if you have any questions, please see me in the back outside. Uh, uh, we'll be right outside the doors here. And uh, as we're closing now, as a part of our benediction, I'm going to ask you guys to stand. And uh, our benediction is, again, we talk about the blessing. You just sang a song about the blessing. And I want us to be able to do that as well. And for you guys to participate with me, if you will, uh, you'll notice on the screen uh, words, and you also probably have it in your bulletin to read along with me. And I'd like for you to participate with me. And let's read this together as we leave here uh, experiencing and receiving God's blessing. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Blessings. Aloha.